All right, very happy to have you here with us. Welcome Liliana Partida. Liliana is a clinical nutritionist. I had the honor of meeting her when I was in California last month. Um, she's been in the health and fitness industry for over 23 years. She's a master chef and educator who's creating lifestyle programs for patients at the Center for New Medicine uh, in Irvine, California. And she currently lectures on nutrition, diabetes, autoimmune disorders, metabolic syndrome, weight loss, and all stages of cancer. Uh, all of Liliana's programs are based on clinical research, a lifetime of experience, and I'm so happy to have you here with us to share some of your amazing information on what you guys are doing out there in California. So thank you. Oh, thank you for having me, Alyssa. I'm really looking forward. We have so much to talk about. Yes, yes, fantastic. So um, as Liliana had, and I had kind of spoken about, you know, in my passion in sharing fasting with the general community, and with the goal of trying to get more people to do it and to realize how accessible it can be, I thought it would be really neat to bring Liliana on here to talk about you know, some of the things that you're seeing in the um, Cancer Center and the Center for New Medicine and what you guys are doing out there with these remarkable tools. Okay, fantastic. So you know, one of my goal as a nutritionist is to meet the patient right where they're at because of course, we'd like patients to do, you know, jump from point A to C, but oftentimes they're not prepared for that. So along with whatever diagnosis they have, uh, whether it's cancer, diabetes, heart disease, uh, weight gain, uh, based on their needs, then I will really create a program that suits their needs. Now, obviously the first thing I wanna do is evaluate their diet and how they live, because really it's not just food, it's the stress that they have, uh, the quality of foods that they're putting in, the relationships they have, everything and on a holistic approach, it's really important to gather that information so that you're really working uh, with every single patient on a lifestyle choice. So obviously, the standard American diet doesn't work for anybody, right? And so I really try to get them to understand the value of living foods. And so a lot of people may not be eating organic foods. And of course, oftentimes they've got this misconception that it's really expensive and, you know, way out of their league. And so again, I kind of give them the dirty dozens, you know, which ones are absolutely necessary. And some of these vegetables or fruits that have hard skins on them, we can kind of be a little bit more lenient with. But the bottom line is they're there for a reason. And that reason is, is to have a better quality of life, whether it is cancer or whether it is anti-aging or weight loss. And so if we really get into the mindset of really, you know, putting foods into our system that have value, uh, why wouldn't we do that regardless of what kind of situation we are medically? So I really like to talk to them about the science. And most patients really have no idea that a yam, which is wonderful and alkaline and delicious has 45 grams of sugar in it when the body digests it. So I really like to break it out in just the simplest terms. I, I really kind of look at uh, uh, the mental map on how we have really uh, set pictures and sounds and taste the five senses into how we learn. And so when I get them to get their basically superior and inferior foods, not good or bad, it makes all the difference in the world because face it, when we eat foods that we consider bad, we feel that we need punishment and that punishment means on a psychological level either we're going to gain more weight or we're going to feel that we're feeding our cancer or that we're in conflict with our desired goal and that's not what my intention is my intention is that nobody's going to do this perfect but the more we honor what our body speaks back to us once we eat we can make adjustments so in the superior food i make it just as simple as possible i just say those superior foods how will you know there's two characteristics when I put it in my mouth, it's not sweet. So think of all your cruciferous vegetables and your salads and your artichokes and your asparagus. None of these foods are sweet. So very easily people can, you know, just in the mindset of, okay, great. You know, I put it in my mouth, it's not sweet. Then this is likely going to be a superior food to prevent me and or treat cancer. Because a lot of these foods I can eat raw uh, as well as cooked, you know, in regards to breaking down some of these nutrients for better digestion we have, when we have a very sensitive GI system. And then the other characteristic is that when you cook them, they shrink. 
So again, if I put a whole tray of broccoli and cauliflower and asparagus, I pull out a half a tray. So I say the bitter, better shrinking foods is where you always want to go. It's going to shrink your waistline. It's going to shrink your blood sugar. And um, that's what we all want regardless, right? Is that mindset of that vitality. So then they get that. They're like, oh, okay, got it. And I said, you know, America loves slogans. So, you know, bitter, better shrinking foods. Let's keep that in our mind. And then I just tell them the inferior food, remember, they're not bad. They're going to be the opposite. They're going to be sweet to the palate, like carrots and beets and corn and peas and butternut squash. Those aren't bad foods. But again, they turn into a lot of sugar very quickly or expansive foods. When I cook them, they get larger. And so, or I call them stubborn foods. They didn't shrink, but they didn't expand. They just stayed the same like a potato. So I say, well, okay, do you want your problem to stay the same? Then these foods may be part of your diet. If you want to expand your problem, which is your blood sugar and your potential in terms of uh, feeding cancer, uh, because sugar is the number one food that it feeds off of, then in mindset, then these are the things that we really make choices upon in regards of what directions we want to go. And like I said, no one is perfect. So I get them off of the grains because they're very expansive and very inflammatory. And so people will say, well, how about quinoa? Quinoa is a protein. It's awesome. And I say, well, it's the most amino acids of any grain, but it's still going to be high in lectins, which is inflammatory to the gut, and high in sugar. It doesn't digest well. So as far as I'm concerned, three strikes and you're out when it comes to treating uh, inflammatory issues, uh, immune issues, and weight gain. Now, if we're a normal person has absolutely no problem, our weight is good, our health is vibrant, can we eat these foods in the diet? Sure, but we want to go gluten-free no matter what, because face it, the, you know, the glyphosates that are being sprayed onto these grains are going to affect anybody regardless they're, if they're in a diseased state or not. So I really kind of give them how many uh, uh, carbohydrates they can consume in a meal based upon how many calories they burn. And so that might be like, say, for example, mostly about 12%. I don't go to a strict ketogenic diet unless patients have brain cancer or um, any kind of lymphomas. Uh, because it's not necessary. We don't need to go to, to that extreme, but we go into the adaptive phase and allow the body to really use that extra stored, uh, you know, calories as fat for fuel. So my goal with each and every patient is they walk out with a plan on eating more vibrant, alive food, getting rid of processed food, junk food, hydrogenated foods, and really, you know, getting them in inspired, well, I, I could say that, to get back into the kitchen even if they're just making one, you know, new recipe a week, by the time, you know, a month is, they've got four new recipes, you know, and face it, we pretty much rotate what we eat anyway. So it works out really nice. And I try to put it in as simple as terms as possible. Love it. Okay. So, so much information right there. This is amazing. That's why I was so excited to have you on. Clearly you're eating right. You have a ton of energy. Um, okay, so we want to eat some of the superior, inf superior foods, less of the inferior foods. Food is right. not good or bad. There's just some that help us become healthier and some that we just want to maybe have less and less of in our daily diet. Is that correct? Exactly. Now, in fact, like for example, carrots and beets. You know, you've got the beta carotene, the nitric oxide. And I say, okay, we can use uh, butternut squash to substitute for a yam. You have that root vegetable. We use spaghetti squash to now replace your spaghetti. So again, I never take anything out unless I can put something in its place that looks the same. On an emotional level, it feels the same. So patients don't feel that they're in a deprivation state. I just say, let's just get rid of the potatoes for now. Let's get rid of the grains for now. If you're vegetarian and you want to do beans, yes, they do expand, but they've got a ton of fiber in it so it reduces the sugar so we keep those in in portion sizes so again everything's about how much sugar does that break down to it when you consume it if they want to have two tablespoons of sweet potato versus three cups of broccoli well that's okay i don't have an issue with that it's not the bad food it's the quantity for fullness Perfect. Okay. And I've seen a lot of your cooking videos. We're going to share that at the end of this interview, but I know you're really big on making sure that people don't feel deprived and you're really big on making things taste really good. And I love how you simplify these recipes uh, and you can tell your food is amazing. So we're definitely going to share that at the end. Let's talk about what is the sugar cancer connection? Why is that so powerful and why does it matter? You know, if people are eating even say a yam that turns into sugar. Okay. 
So oftentimes uh, people have high insulin levels and anything that stimulates insulin makes things grow. Insulin is a storage hormone. Uh, so oftentimes uh, our patients will have elevated glucose levels and I'm not talking about fasting glucose. I'm talking about a, over a three month period of saturation called hemoglobin A1C. Now that tells us whether a person is in a uh, pre-diabetic state or if they've already crossed the line. Now, one thing we know for sure that cancer thrives in an environment of glucose, low oxygen and acidity. Now, these are three things that anybody can you know, alter and change by the choices that they make. And so, uh, so what we look at is we say, since you know, sugar is cancer's primary food, and so we wanna get that sugar out of the blood and utilize it for energy, the first thing we start doing is trying to get their carbohydrates down low enough so they can rehabilitate their cells instead of being bombarded and making them insulin resistant. So instead of them eating and letting insulin be a vehicle that drives all of those calories to the muscle, to the cells and to the liver, um, they end up with a half a gas tank of gas and they get hungry in an hour and a half and then they start this insulin potentiation all over again. When insulin is, your is in your blood, you do not burn fat for fuel. And one of the goals that we're trying to teach our patient patients is let's become a fat burner so that our body can break down uh, essential fatty acids and sugars that are in our blood in between our meals so that we don't stimulate insulin and we can continue to use fat as a source of fuel. So it's really important for our patients to understand that glucose feeds cancer. And the lower we can get, the better environment it is that they don't want to be a guest in your home because there's nothing to eat. Great. Okay. And so I know you've touched on um, ketosis and more of using it as a tool and being keto adapted or fat adapted. Uh, so basically what we've learned over you know, the past few years about eating is that we need to eat every couple hours. And this is driving this glucose insulin response that you're talking about. So I know you guys use ketosis as a tool, like keto adapted, like you're talking about to help people uh, burn fat and you use fasting. Yes. Right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that. How does that change things up? How does that switch us from using glucose into fat? So uh, one of the things is um, think about it, you know, there's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so in essence, the mindset of eating every three hours, and I think that concept went into the effect that uh, when you uh, digest food, it takes the most amount of energy of any bodily function. So they think you're burning calories more effectively, but that is not the fact. That means you're taking energy from all the other processes of the body, detoxification, your brain capacity, and it's all going and being utilized in the digestive system. And so, uh, so, the, you know, so, so eating every couple of hours, they were thinking, oh, that was metabolically boosting you up. But in fact, it's the complete opposite. So we want to really consume meals every four to five hours. So it's very easy from breakfast to lunch to go without having a snack. But oftentimes between lunch and dinner, there's longer period of time, more than four hours. So during that period of time, so that we don't have an insulin surge because they've eaten protein, a boiled egg, or they've eaten a piece of fruit, which is glucose, um, you choose to opt for a fat only because fat crosses the blood brain barrier uh, and the cell wall without the need of insulin. So when my patients are hungry between that time, I don't want anybody to be in a deprivation mindset or suffer, oh, this is so hard, is just have a little handful of macadamia nuts, maybe Maybe even a cup of tea with a tablespoon or a teaspoon of some coconut oil or celery with almond butter, something that keeps the carbohydrates down to the minimal amount, but more in the fat so that the brain can feel like it's got a, you know, 130 calories. But again, there's no insulin being stimulated. So we continue. Now, when you're calorically restricted in what you eat, let's just say anywhere between 800 calories, to, uh, you know, down, your body needs to have a secondary source of fuel. And what it does first is it burns all the sugars that are in your muscle and the stored sugars that are in your liver. And then after that, it has to use fat as its uh, secondary source of fuel. Those uh, fatty acids, they're converted into what we call ketone bodies. Now the ketones, they don't turn into sugar, they turn into fuel 
fuel that feeds the metabolism, fuel that feeds the brain for mental clarity. And we really thought, you know, we had this down as far as that uh, cancer cells cannot consume ketones, but they can to a very small degree, but it's really, really difficult. So, oops, let me just get that thing off. What happened here? You're good, we don't see it. Oh, okay, good. Um, so they, uh, what they do is uh, they're able to give us energy, but without the surge of insulin in it, which is really important. So then we have all of this good energy. We use fat for fuel because we are calorically needing something. Now every three hours what happens is when insulin is out of your blood, you get a signal. The brain says, oh, isn't it time for a snack? And you say, well, yeah, I would like to have a little something, but why don't you go to that you know, fat bank over there and get some of that you know, excess calories and let's use that for fuel. So again, if you have a little bit of fat, that would be okay because it's not insulin potentiated, but that is our goal. We want to have uh, no snacks as much as possible. If you need one, a fat snack, and then absolutely no snacks after dinner is really, really important as well. So we're essentially giving the body this time to focus less on digestion and create energy diversion where uh, our body's focus can go more towards healing and other processes. So I know you talked about in the past, uh, everybody was kind of thinking that cancer can't use ketones as fuel, and it can, but that its preferred fuel source is glucose by a long shot. And so as we're, as we're teaching the body more to use fat as a fuel source, cancer's not going to be as happy. Exactly. It's not going to have its preferred fuel source also creating increased oxygenated environment, which we're passionate about. We love hyperbaric oxygen. And then increasing more of an alkaline environment, which obviously a lot of the foods, the cruciferous vegetables that you talked about are gonna help. Now, do you guys go into longer, longer times of fasting with your patients? You know, we do. Um, it, clinically speaking, uh, we'd like to get our patients to fast. Uh, water fasting would be preferably, or a bone broth fast at least one day before any kind of chemotherapy treatment. And a lot of times we do insulin potentiated, so it makes it a really um, a good atmosphere in that you know, our, our, our targeted medication can get, to where it need, can get to where it needs to go. Now, um, we do that quite often the day before and then the day after. We also use uh, fasting for a variety of other reasons, for detoxification, for weight loss, um, are, very, uh, are two good reasons why we would do that. And especially if I want to get somebody uh, that wants to lose weight into a ketosis state a little bit faster, then I would have them you know, do intermittent fasting, kind of start out slow, giving up your breakfast so that you have a longer period of time between the time you ate dinner until you eat again at lunchtime, which is really, really simple to do. And then, um, and then we go from there in regards of uh, the patient's emotional state, because obviously there's a difference between emotional hunger and real hunger. And so um, I love intermittent fasting for that reason. But then after we do that for like four or five days, and then we can start getting them to have maybe, um, you know, uh, a, a shake and uh, maybe just a light salad, going more to vegetarian foods and getting rid of the animal protein and some steamed vegetables until really we've got them doing, you know, uh, one meal in the afternoon and lots of water and herbal teas uh, during the day and then moving them into that fasting state uh, makes it a really easy transition. And then they don't get the headaches, they don't get uh, the, Herx effect of, the Herx effect, which means that they're detoxing faster, then their body can get rid of the toxins, and, um, and then they end up feeling a little nauseous and stuff. So I think that works really well for a lot of our patients. Great, you're, I know you're big on meeting people where they are, and I love that. Um, kind of a whole other topic, but I just recently heard of this insulin potentiated chemo that you just brought up, and I want to talk about that a little bit. What is that? Well, it's what, what, what it is, is that we put the patient in a state to drive their glucose level down as much as possible. And then what we do is we administer uh, the chemo with insulin, 
uh, so that it, you know, once this insulin comes up, it's a driver, it drives things into the cell wall. And so it goes straight to the targeted patient. Now, of course, we have to be very careful because we don't want the insulin level, uh, the glucose levels to drop too severely. So we have patients on standby with, you know, some little uh, uh, grapes or things like that that can raise their glucose level up, quick, you know, uh, when we need it. So it's a very safe procedure and very effective at only targeting the area rather than exposing the whole body uh, to the toxins. Fascinating. You guys are doing amazing, amazing things out there. I loved visiting the center. Okay. So a lot of the people watching our videos are just starting to consider fasting. Um, some people are fasting. And is there anything that you would want to share about perhaps how powerful a tool this can be as far as prevention goes? Um, and maybe why people should have this in their wheelhouse and know how to do it? Yes, I think fasting is probably one of my most favorite prevention tools. First of all, we all know that caloric restriction is an anti-aging way of being. And so again, uh, as I said, if it could lower uh, issues of blood pressure and uh, uh, weight and uh, mental clarity, Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, kidney issues, lots of things that you know, a lot of people have and they live with, that why wouldn't we adapt this into our life? Now, again, there's all kinds of fasting, whether it's just going to be the intermittent fasting where they're, you know, not eating uh, for, I, I call this, you know, kind of cyclical fasting, where you've got just a targeted time of eating, which is really great for your digestive system. So let's just say, you know, you start eating at 12 o'clock in the afternoon and you eat till six or seven o'clock. So you've got like a eight hour, five hour window. Well, that takes, that gives a lot more energy to other facilities of the body to repair, to detoxify, uh, and to, you know, work on other, you know, getting rid of the bugs in our body. And so uh, it's a very powerful tool uh, in that regards. Now, as far as uh, what it does, it's really incredible because a lot of people say, oh, when you go on fast, you lose so much uh, muscle, but in all actuality, uh, lower calories, a lower caloric diet, like let's just say 500 or 800 calorie diet a day, you lose a lot more muscle than you actually do a really good water fast. And, and the reason being is because there's, there's this whole really cool adaptive phase that happens. So in the first, let's just say 24 to 48 hours, your body is using all of the stored uh, glucose and glycogen and in the liver. And then now it's going to go to its secondary uh, fuel of some fatty acids. Well, during this period of time, what happens is um, we start to create different hormones to support ourselves, And so right about on the third day, when you start to produce these ketones, it also makes you feel not hungry. So ketones uh, is providing uh, mental acuity and energy, uh, you know, but at the same time, it's also telling the body, look, there's no food, so kind of get over yourself and you're using fatty acids for fuel, so you do have enough to survive, so don't stress out, right? And then after that, uh, about the fourth day, uh, the body starts going in to produce a human growth hormone, really doubling the amount of human growth hormone. And what does human growth hormone do? It keeps us young and it helps us to repair. And the reason it does that, it's because it's trying to preserve your muscle. So in all actually, and I'll actually, we're not burning the muscle at all. We're actually creating uh, a hormone, um, uh, epinephrine, which is basically adrenal, uh, adrenaline, to raise your metabolism uh, so that you don't break down lean muscle tissue. And of course, in a primal mindset, we'd want that uh, raised metabolism so we can go hunt for some food, right? So it's really cool. So it's going to lower my insulin levels. It's going to, uh, you know, give me brain pool to sustain myself. I'm not going to be hungry. I'm going to increase human growth hormone. I'm going to increase more mitochondria, which is the engines that make energy, which is so important for cancer. As a matter of fact, around in the third, fourth day where it starts to actually break down your um, dead cells in your body, uh, it's called autophagy. And so how great is that for a cancer patient if you're now starting to scavenge the body for all this cellular debris that could end up in more free radical oxidation in the body 
So it has so many health benefits. Uh, and I just say everybody should try their hand at it, whether it is a one day fast uh, or up to a three day fast or even longer. And of course, longer fasts should be, you know, uh, really medically um, um, observed or with a, a coach uh, in that nature is always better. Uh, but I think that uh, whether it's intermittent fasting or fasting every once or twice a week is awesome or longer periods of fast, I think everybody should try it because there's so much benefit. Absolutely. I agree. And like you mentioned, this is really, uh, we call it an ancient healing strategy. So our bodies are designed to be able to go these periods of time without food because genetically we still are hunters and gatherers. And so if when we went long periods of time without food, if our mental clarity tanked and if we lost muscle, we would not survive. No. So I know when you're talking about three day, four day, five day fast, you know, some people might think this is a really long time and how do you do that? Um, we are designed to be able to do that. When I first got into fasting, there is no way I would have considered a five day fast. However, just like training for, you know, a run or any other physical event or even mental event, when you start slowly, like you're saying, and when you meet patients where they are, you slowly start to chip away and these things become more, um, more imaginable that you can do. And again, like you said, in day three, when you're peaking ketones and you get this mental clarity and you're no longer hungry, it's more of an emotional habit than actually a physical need for food. Um, Absolutely. We, did, we do in our, our seven-week program, we teach people how to do this. And at the end, it's an invited multi-day fast. And I've shared our experience on our YouTube channel with how we felt and how we got through it. Um, but again, just like what you're saying, I think that this is such a phenomenal tool. There's no such thing as a failed fast. And you don't have to do a three, four, five-day fast. But we know that it's a powerful tool for if we need it later for you know, deep healing but even the intermittent fasting is so incredibly powerful. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, I probably would intermittent fast five days a week and I do it with a bulletproof drink. Now, remember when you're fasting, depending on what you're doing it for, if it's for detoxification, I probably wouldn't add this, but things like even, you know, coffee, one cup of coffee a day, which can blunt your hunger or some green tea, which is going to have the ECGs and high antioxidants are awesome. And so like for me, just basically utilizing it as a tool for anti-aging, because I'm 61 years old. And so I want to stay as young as possible is I just put, you know, my matcha green tea and I do it decaffeinated. So it doesn't have to be caffeinated, but of course, caffeine blunts hunger. And I just put a table, a teaspoon of coconut oil and a couple of teaspoons of coconut cream or some organic whipping cream, which is just basically all fat, whip that thing up in the blender. And then I love it. It's great. It's like a latte. And, um, you know, I'm still not introducing protein and I'm still not introducing carbs. So my body still stays in that intermittent fasting state until I eat lunch, which is usually around one o'clock. And that keeps me more at my ideal deal weight very simply. Uh, so I, I, lo I love doing that. It's, you know, it feels good. I've got great mental clarity. Um, and so I, I would recommend that highly for anybody who just kind of wants to start off what it feels like. You, you mentioned something about, you know, uh, fasting. Now, now think about it. This is like uh, ancient in, 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 its, in its use, you know, for religious purposes. And so one of the things that I think is really important is that everybody gets a little, just to be a little bit more quiet during this period of time where they're fasting, go a little bit more inward. And I love using uh, tools like meditation. And if people are new to meditation, then I like uh, using um, different apps that I have on my phone. I, li I like Insight Timer. It's got like 15,000 meditation tapes on it. So then now what you're doing is you're also coaching them into a new way of looking and being at themselves and honoring that. So every morning, you know, just you know, before you get out of that bed, you do a little bit of meditation. You know, what's my intent today? How can I stay focused with this so that I don't emotionally get thrown off? And then, of course, we get all those little hormones and immediately our brain says, wouldn't you like a cookie? Wouldn't you like some carbohydrates? And in essence, you know, we need to emotionally satisfy ourselves so we don't have those cravings cravings that, you know, can sabotage us at any stage of our diet. Right. Absolutely. I mean, you really start to realize how emotional the connection with food is when you have an intention of fasting and you yeah. catch yourself going because of certain feelings you're having. Right. And usually after the third day, honestly, 
my patients say, I feel so fantastic, my mental clarity, and like, you know, my, my, my partner that I work with by cooking, you know, she does fasting all the time, 10 days, 14 days, and, and I said, well, gosh, how can you, uh, we're editing this cookbook, how can you be looking at this? She goes, no, I'm really excited because it makes me realize all the really wonderful things I'm going to eat when I get off this fast. <laughs> that's cool you know and so it's really important to remember that food is a dopamine enhancer and so when people are reaching for foods that really are not vital to life force then they have to ask themselves you know what where have i not met my personal needs that i'm using this food as a drug and it will never satisfy that hunger and so really again this is a wonderful opportunity during fasting or any kind of lifestyle change is to really take a good look about how you are meeting your own personal needs and what does that look like you know with exercise with stress management with love in your life with connectedness uh, with nature uh, and then you really start to build a good foundation for people to start saying wow okay i get this and I'm really starting to feel the difference. And I like the way this difference feels. And, and then they become, you know, lifelongers and they start being, becoming advocates to, uh, you know, a, a wellness mindset. Love it. Yes, absolutely. And well, it's clearly working for you. You look amazing. You have an abundant amount of energy and information. Um, I could, I could be on this with you for forever. I feel like we're both so passionate about similar topics. I think what we'll do is, you know, you touched on uh, superior foods and inferior foods. I love that concept. Uh, I wrote it down as well. Bitter, better, shrinking foods is what we want to focus on. Yes. Uh, fasting as a powerful tool, becoming fat adapted as a powerful tool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share your platforms. I definitely want people to have access to all of your information. I know you've got a, an exciting event coming up, uh, the Six Pillars. Yes. So it's called the six uh, pillars of keto stacking. So, um, you know, after really coaching hundreds of patients, it's really uh, what I realized is that we really need baby steps and really it's like A, B and C. And so I've set up a course. It's going to be a two month webinar series. So honestly, it's like I have I don't think I've. I have left one rock uncovered uh, in regards to the information that we're going to give them with, you know, five minute videos of intentions for the day. Uh, good morning. Hi, it's Liliana. And, you know, let's put our intention here. So just that motivating factor and then to direct them to the areas of interest uh, along with, you know, an eating plan for vegetarian and also a, a regular keto style. And then even to the point where we're saying, okay, you no know time to cook. Okay, this is what you do. Okay, you're, you're, you, you have no choice but to go to this fast food. Okay, what should you eat when you go there? So it's really user friendly. And like I said, it's taken us months and months to do this, but I'm really going to be happy uh, and really trying to reach millions of people to realize that uh, living a healthy lifestyle is joyful with lots of flavor. And there's so much opportunity and being able to enhance their life that maybe they never thought would be possible. Perfect, love it. Okay, well, we'll make sure that we share all of your information so that everybody has access to it. And I'm so excited to, to share this interview and I look forward to seeing you soon. I know we'll stay connected. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.